against the majority of core domains might reside in Genesis custom build evolution stage, where you have a high level of change rate, high level of uncertainties, high level of differentiation advantage. So that's something that you should focus on building in-house. If you're outsourcing these elements, you bear the risk of jeopardizing your business success. There were some companies who did that and they failed. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Boundless Conversations podcast. On this podcast, we, we meet with pioneers, thinkers, and doers, and we talk about the future of business models, organizations, markets, and society in our rapidly changing world. Today, I'm joined by uh, Susan Kaiser, who is an independent tech uh, consultant from Germany uh, with uh, more than 20 years of experience in, in software development industry. Uh, she has been doing some incredible uh, novel and seminar work in putting together a lot of useful techniques and practices that exist in this liminal space between how we organize and the artifacts we create, uh, especially with software-based products. Hi, Susan. It's truly a great uh, pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Simon. I was exposed to Susan's work uh, for the first time uh, earlier this year as I was uh, uh, researching uh, ways to approach, uh, let's say, a process of uh, uh, unbundling and rebundling an organization uh, in ways that are uh, market driven, uh, product portfolio aware. And uh, uh, I encountered a piece on InfoQ titled uh, Adaptive Socio-Technical Systems with Architecture for Flow, Worldly Maps, Domain-Driven Design, and Team Topologies, which uh, I would say, um, uh, Suzanne, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say is some sort of cul culmination of several years of work, uh, right? Of course, yeah. Decades of work, I would say, from others. <laughs> so building up on, on the shoulders of giants. So, yeah. So not only your work, actually work of somebody else as well. So it's great. And um, I believe that uh, there is also a book uh, coming up, uh, if I'm right. Exactly. Still in the process, in the review process, but it's uh, hopefully yeah, going to be pu published. You can pre-order on, on Amazon, by the way, mm -hmm. and uh, also in other places, I guess. Uh, let's say that your work is really uh, embodying some kind of uh, coalescing that we are seeing of these three key elements uh, when we speak about organizing. So uh, first of all, organizations are becoming more product centric. For example, the importance of understanding product differentiation and portfolio management and so on. Uh, software is hitting the world. So a lot of the work we do as companies uh, now is actually software. And uh, uh, evolution is also becoming faster and faster, right? The world is changing faster. So world day mapping is a, is a very good technique to understand evolution and evolution is accelerating. So we have to understand it. You know, we need to acknowledge that there is, as we discussed, a, 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 an inherent challenge in explaining your work uh, without visuals, but mm -hmm. we'll try. Um, and from time to time, especially for our YouTube uh, uh, listeners, uh, we will maybe use some pictures. So uh, if you're listening to this, Uh, through a podcast uh, platform, we suggest you to switch maybe to YouTube, where we can also watch some of these pictures. It would be helpful. And uh, we'll certainly put some links in the show notes where you can find the article and maybe listening to the podcast as you watch the article would be helpful. As a starting point, Suzanne, what I would like to ask you is maybe to introduce us a bit of the work that you have been doing uh, and the three core methodologies that you used. Maybe you can introduce our listeners I'm sure some of them will be familiar with this, but maybe you can introduce these three techniques and explain how you put them together uh, into a new novel approach that you are now experimenting uh, uh, with your customers, with your partners, and so on. I was inspired more by Dr. Russell Eckhoff, one of the pioneers of system thinking, because he stated that the system itself is more than the sum of its parts. It's a product of the interaction, so the way parts Uh, fit together determines the performance of a system, not on how they perform taken separately. And that brought me, like, so when I started my career, I was just, uh, I was focusing on local optimization of separate parts uh, instead of like thinking of, of the whole of the system. But as Dr. Russell Eckhoff said, um, that we have to focus on how they are interacting with each other and, and not only, um, yeah, how they are composed of each other. And so that brought me then more to a holistic view to bring three different pr perspectives together. So one perspective from business strategy, um, for example, with water mapping, 
invented by Simon Wardley. Then the other one more about like software design. Um, so for example, um, domain driven design from Eric Evans. And then the third perspective that came later into my uh, tool set um, by, um, by the team organization was team topology by Mr. Skelton and Manuel Paish. So, and I like to bring this tool set together as a holistic approach um, in order to build adaptive socio-technical systems that are optimized for fast law of change so that then can respond to changes quickly in our ever-changing environment where we have to, to equip ourselves or equip organization to absorb changes gracefully so that they do not get overrun by their competitors. Instead, they can yeah, act ahead of, of their competitors and um, also to try to figure out what future opportunities come up and uh, in terms of like combining these three perspectives together and where also to strategically invest in most. So for example, we try to, um, to, to focus our strategic investment on our core domain, which provides competitive advantage instead of like um, reinventing the wheel or um, custom building commodities that are not core to our business. So then we uh, also, it's all combined to, uh, together. And also from Conway's law, we know that the communication structure in your organization has a, has a huge impact on your software design um, uh, later on. And so also like how the teams are uh, split, how they're interacting with each other, then also resembles in your software architecture and your software design later on as well. So from my perspective, bringing um, business strategy with water mapping, software design with domain-driven design and um, team organization with team topologies together is for me a great tool set to equip an organization um, for fast flow of change and also enable organization to incorporate fast feedback as well. So if I can try to provide our listeners with, with some kind of, kind of navigating map, hmm? when we look into your work and we see these three big pieces, you know, the, the first piece you, you told me, for example, you always start with world mapping and uh, it feels like uh, uh, you have to start with uh, setting up the situational awareness, right? So first step, situational awareness, for who are we building? What is the context around our company? How, things, how are things evolving around our company? Then you move into domain-driven design, which is, for me at least, it's a lot about what are we building? So mm -hmm. what is the ontology you know, of the things that we are building? For, uh, you know, what are the users? What are the, the pieces? How the pieces connect and differentiate? And then the team topologies piece is more like how we organize to, to produce a flow and to produce an organization that can continuously evolve. So I would like to ask you maybe to tell me a little bit more of what are the key steps in the process. And I would really love to, to hear from you what are the key, uh, I don't want to say surprises, but uh, um, I mean, I see, I see that most of the times when we work with organizations, there's a lot of gap between what it really takes to be performative in a, in a market like the one we, we live today and how organizations are at the moment. So really, maybe if you can uh, stress a bit and explain a bit uh, uh, the gaps that you are going to overcome by applying this approach. So I guess one of the greatest benefit is um, in this approach. So the, the first benefit that I encounter a lot is the common understanding or shared understanding of the landscape on the one side, like, oh, I get a lot of like feedback, like, oh, I didn't know that we are doing this. Oh, really? We also have this users and they have this user need. So it's, it's um, to, to generate this shared understanding and also to understand the problem first before we provide a solution is very important um, Yeah, in, in, in every organization that provides services or products in the market. So for example, um, to create this shared understanding, I start first with creating the water map um, that is visualizing the landscape and organizations operating competing in, and, and it's com composed of a y-axis and an x-axis. And on the y-axis, you try to find or to try to identify first your user and your user needs. So these are the anchor of your map. And your users could be your customers, but it could, uh, could be business partners. And this could also be internal users as well. And uh, you can also generate different water maps in your organization it does not have to be just one. It could, for example, be one water map for one user or even one water map for one user need. So it depends on your context. And um, so, and they usually start with like, okay, let's collect all users that you have that are using your services currently. And then also switch to the internal perspective as well for your internal products. So just like collect all the users first. So I don't, I don't restrict it. And it, 
And for this conversation, oh, we only have one user. So when before we start this workshop, like when we bring all together, uh, then uh, a lot of new users come up that, that others were not aware of. And and I guess there's like, oh, yeah, we also have this users. And and then I go into, then I scope the Wortley map or the first Wortley map. It's an iterative process. So it's not have, it, it's not perfect. It, it's not like uh, it's just an abstraction. And uh, you can start yeah, with picking just one user, for example, and then, okay, what are their user needs? You can follow a user journey if you want to. And uh, the users and the user need that are representing then the problem domain later when we come to domain-driven design, it's like, okay, what is the subject area for which we build a product for or service for? And then uh, from there, like uh, after each of them, like have understood the problem itself and what we try to solve, then we can go into the solution space. And that's uh, where we come to the value chain and the y-axis. So what components are necessary to fulfill the user needs directly or indirectly. So it's a chain of dependencies or a chain of dependent components. And um, on the top of the value chain, we have components that are most visible to the users for their, where users are touching your, your product or services directly. And on the top, it gets less and less visible to the users. And then you, for example, that's just the, the y-axis. And then you try to plot those components on the x-axis and you try to plot them to assign evolution stages from left to right. So from Genesis, that's on the left side with brand new things and custom build and product and rentals such as off the shelf products or open source software solutions and commodity and utility on the right, for example, cloud hosted services. This also like trying to map the components like um, towards the evolution stages gives you also an indication or an understanding of your landscape. So for example, one question is uh, that are you custom building commodities, as I mentioned earlier, that are not core to your business? That can be kind of like identify some some outliers, like, oh, we could use utility services, for example, for that one. Also with the trade-off, of course, like it has to, in, to be integrated and so on. It's not just like that everything is out of the box. We have to put in some adjustments as well. Yeah, you don't have to build everything from scratch. And the other thing is then also how like identify instabilities and potential risks. Each evolution stage itself addresses different characteristics. So towards the left spectrum, towards Genesis and custom build, components are changing far more frequently, are more certain, uncertain, are like there we are dealing with unknown unknowns. On the right spectrum, towards the right spectrum, towards commodity and utility, there we have like um, yeah, standardized components, widespread, well understood markets and the change rate, uh, they are changing not as frequently as components on the, on the left spectrum. If you, for example, have a value chain, which is where you have a lot of components and maybe in product and rental and they are built on top of like volatile components on the left spectrum, that could indicate some instabilities um, to make them. So because you're building on top of constantly changing components and maybe that was some purpose. Maybe you have decided we would like to introduce this new technology. Uh, but at least it creates awareness. It it's, it's reveals it and something uh, so th which was happening before. Like, why are we yeah wasting so much time and tr trying to stabilize components, for example? And this the water map can help you to reveal those those situations like outliers, instabilities, and risk. And also, when we can combine it then later on with domain driven design, we can also identify areas like, for example, with the subdomain types that comes from domain-driven design with core domains supporting generic subdomains. So core domain providing competitive advantage, that's where you sh should strategically invest the most. These are the elements that you should build in-house, supporting that are components that support the core domain, but do not provide competitive advantage, are existing and other competitive solutions as well. And there you can decide, well, should we custom build or should we use a rather an off-the-shelf product? It does not jeopardize your, your, your solution or your business if you are using also off-the-shelf products and Genesis, these are elements or components, for example, authentication, registration, that every business systems have, or a lot of other business systems have, they are very widespread and ubiquitous. So there you can definitely look out, watch out for components uh, that are available in the market as commodity service or off-the-shelf products. So you should not focus on custom building those because they do not provide competitive advantage unless they are your core domains. That is the conversation that I have uh, when we are going to, towards like looking at the water map of some of my clients. So the water map is, provides a visualized, structured way 
to generate a common understanding and challenge also your own assumptions and um, creating a shared understanding of the landscape. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then from there, we can use this one as foundation to look into details also like, okay, where can we, for example, decompose some, some components and where we can bring in, for example, um, domain-driven design later on. It's really important to um, kind of objectivize visually the understanding, the knowledge that there is in a leadership team or in a, in a portfolio team, right? Definitely. So it is because it definitely helps you to, to detach mm -hmm. personal preferences from the conversation because you bring this on the water map. If you then decide, okay, we would like to custom build this component, you can then run into a trade-off analysis, like, okay, what does it bring us? What are the pros and cons? And I also try to have like a structured way for discussion. And it, it starts with sharing this map um, or yeah, it was, was creating this map altogether, like the conversation that you have around bringing in different assumptions together, trying to, yeah, mm -hmm. to, to create this water map. So it does not like that one person is like, okay, it's this way, only this way. Instead, it's like, this collaborative approach to create a shared understanding of the landscape. It's not only one, it's all, it's the team that creates the world map together. World map uh, gives you a lot of understanding in terms of uh, what is the value that the user perceives, uh, what is the stage of evolution of certain components. And I think uh, lots of organizations fail to understand, uh, at least this is my experience, that uh, the products they create, the services they create, exist in a competitive environment. And uh, it's the market that dictates the evolutionary stage of the technologies they use, the, uh, the tools that they develop, and so on. Maybe an easy example would be a, a data center or something like that. Uh, a data center uh, at the moment uh, um, you know, is something that has evolved to become ubiquitous and, and cloud-based. And, and so it's not that you as a company or as a team inside a company can decide what is the stage of evolution of a certain component, but it's rather the um, market that defines the stage of evolution. And I think uh, in my experience, that's something that companies sometimes fail to understand. You know, it's not something you can define internally. It's rather something that gets defined by the market. I think world -like mapping in general give you, I would say something that companies can understand, right? Understanding their situational awareness. But uh, um, it's rather uh, rare to see companies understanding the concepts in domain-driven design, you know? So maybe you can spend a few more words in terms of um, why applying domain-driven design and understanding, you mentioned this before, right? The core domain, the generic subdomains, the supporting domains. What does it mean for an organization to understand in the stack that generates their value proposition to understand what domains are the core ones that create an advantage, constitute an advantage, what are the supporting ones that can support different products maybe, or, and what are the generic ones that maybe they should be outsourcing. Maybe you can double click a bit on this, uh, the second strategic piece that emerged from, from the analysis that you do. Definitely. So yeah, it, the, so as you already mentioned, the subdomain types of domain-driven design from the strategic design perspective enables us to prioritize our strategic investment. So we would like to focus our strategic investment in terms of like, okay, where put we all the development effort into those parts that are generating the greatest value, where we see um, that we are differentiating ourselves from competitors, so where we can innovate on. So these are the core domain related parts that uh, yeah, differentiates ourselves from, from our competitors. So at least like it has so competitive advantage from Michael E. Porter, he says competitive advantage is composed of differentiation advantage uh, and or cost advantage. And core domain is also subject to evolve, right? So Simon Water says everything evolves through the forces of demand and supply competition. So everything evolves through the stages at some point in time. You don't know when, but if you have so demand and supply competition, then definitely component will evolve. Also your core domain at some point. So usually I guess the majority of core domains might reside in Genesis custom build evolution stage where you can, uh, yeah, where you have a high level of change rate, high level of uncertainties, high level of differentiation advantage. So that's something that you should focus on building in house. If you're outsourcing these elements, you might 
you bear the risk of jeopardizing your business success. There were some companies who did that and they failed. I would love to have some data like how many people are, how many organizations try to outsource a quota main, but I guess, um, I can't remember, was it Hertz? Years ago, they tried to um, outsource their quota mains. It was highly expensive for them and also high level of risk as well. Um, so definitely you should custom build your quarter mains in house. And then also like your system usually does not, or your, your product that you provide usually, um, consist of also other subdomain types, for example, supporting subdomains that are not necessarily provide competitive advantage, but are necessary for, yeah, for, for example, user experience, um, for example, notification handling, like that could be something, um, that you could, consider as and it depends on your own context of course and then that is something okay you can decide on custom building that in-house but you have to be aware that you should not put a lot of strategic investment in that part of the system or mm -hmm. you if there is exist an off-the-shelf product that is easily to integrate you can can think of that one it does not jeopardize your business success if you're using third-party solutions and then the generic subdomains these are like authentication registration as i mentioned earlier these could be uh, these are potential candidates for generic subdomains that exist not only in your competitor solutions, but um, are far more widespread in other um, business solutions as well. And definitely these are candidates where you should not custom build it. If you are in, intending or planning to do that, then uh, yeah, you have to have a good strategic reason for that one, why you should custom build these part of the solution that does not provide um, competitive advantage at all in your subdomain types. So it helps you that the subdomain tips from domain driven design that is, that is happening in the, in the problem space, right? So these are, for example, reflected in your users and their user needs. Then you can also switch to the solution space of strategic design of domain driven design. And that's where we then try to identify boundaries, uh, that encapsulate domain models that represent a particular business logic a specific part of your system and the bounded context helps to enforce um, modularity and high cohesion um, in the bounded context itself related to business behavior that should set together so whenever you change a specific business behavior that you need to change it only in one part of the system these bounded contexts on the other side can be good candidates for um, suitable team boundaries for Streamline teams, mm -hmm. and that's where we switch then to the team organization and try to go into like, yeah, identify suitable team boundaries, what teams, and also in order to to um, establish clear ownership boundaries so that we don't have shared responsibilities, like one component shared by multiple teams. That is usually not a good um, good idea because then you diffuse the ownership. Instead, that. One bounded context should be owned by one team only. However, one team can own several bounded contexts. It depends then on their team cognitive load, how many bounded contexts they can own. So domain-driven design to summarize is on the one side, helps you to, um, to prioritize your strategic investment, what to build in-house, where to make, you yeah, to make build, buy or outsource decisions together combined with a word limit. And um, then the bounded context, when we switch to the solution space, they help you then also to decompose your system into modular parts, well encapsulated parts, but also are good um, candidates for um, team boundaries, um, ownership boundaries. And there we come to team topologies, mm -hmm. for example, um, where streamlined teams could own specific parts of the system. The impression that I have is that uh, even if you start with word day mapping, as you said, it looks like the domain-driven design, so this idea of understanding bounded context, okay, which is, uh, uh, to be honest, very alien to most of the organizations I talk to, especially those that do not make software or at least make software very rarely or as a small part of maybe more complex business processes. Uh, which may entail, I don't know, manufacturing or hardware or, or soft service delivery, whatever. So domain-driven design and, and in general, this idea of understanding bounded context, it's a competence that is very rare and uh, it looks like instead in your practice, it becomes a, really the anchor of the work, you know, because 
if I understand well, for example, you can maybe kind of draft your first award lay map that represents your organization as a chain of value from your users into your capabilities and, and so on. But then when you apply DDD, domain driven design, you start to understand these bounded contexts and, you, and uh, the bounded contexts become on one side the piece that you can move uh, in the map. For a certain bounded context, you can say this is a genesis, something new, or maybe this is a commodity or whatever. So it's really important for you to understand the bounded context, to understand the level of evolution. And secondly, uh, given the, the Conway law uh, implications, uh, bounded contexts are, as you said, normally very good entry points, very good initial starting points to build your team structures, right? Because you know, in an ideal world, let's say, if you have an organization with five bounded contexts, uh, maybe you want to have five teams, you know, I'm just making it simple, because each team can run its own, inside its own system, and the concepts and the ideas and the domain elements that are inside these bounded contexts normally are not overlapped across bounded contexts, right? So as you said, you can change subparts of the system and only impact the subpart and then use interfaces uh, for the other parts of the system. And in this way, you have a modular organization, you have a modular portfolio, and so on. So first point, understanding bounded context emerges in your practice as a very important capability for organizations. So understanding what you are building, what are the, bound, the boundaries among the context, uh, that's become, uh, becoming a very important point. Another question that I would like to ask you is that uh, maybe you, if you can double click a bit uh, on this idea of bounded context in the business environment and uh, maybe dif difficulties or that uh, teams normally encounter on defining this bounded context. And finally, as a second point, I would like to ask you, how do you overlap the concept of products into this system, right? Because so far we discussed about bounded contexts as, let's say, pieces of the organization that are more or less self-contained. Uh, uh, then we discussed about teams, but we never discussed about products. And Normally, in our practice, a lot of the, the work we do is about product-centric organizations. And when we think about a product, we, we tend to consider a PNL, so something you can sell, something that can produce revenues as some cost, and so on. So again, two points. First of all, if you can jump into uh, explaining a bit better what a bounded context is in this context. And secondly, how do you uh, use the concept of products and portfolios when you use this bounded context and the team structures to, con to construct, let's say, product portfolios in the organizations? First of all, I guess identifying or driving bounded context or boundaries is not easy. And it's totally fine if you struggle with that one. I guess everyone is struggling with, with that one and requires a few iterations. And maybe, yeah, it's, it's something that you have to adjust it along the journey as well. I try to identify areas where we have related behavior and um, so that shall sit together. So when it change, that it should not. So bounded context itself, they try to uh, enforce modularity and high cohesion. So high cohesion in terms of like that related business behavior shall sit together. But also they try to minimize tight change coupling. So whenever you make introduce a change, because we are the uh, overarching goal is to optimize our system for a fast flow of change. So when we introduce a change for example, um, of a specific behavior, that this behavior is encapsulated in a specific part. And what I usually do is I introduce event storming sessions to organizations. So I'm bringing then domain experts and development teams together. So it's that's very crucial that um, that we bring um, all the domain experts and development teams together to create this, again, a shared understanding of the domain, which is then described in the shared language, the ubiquitous language. It was just very important also to identify bounded contexts. And what I use is then um, event storming techniques from invented by Alberto Andolini, a lightweight technique to express what happens in your domain, expressed with domain events, expressed in past tense, you have color-coded sticky notes um, where you bring them, you collect, start usually with, okay, express what happens in your domain with domain events, for example, order placed or user registered or um, a session proposal submitted or something like that. So that has 
we try to avoid CRUD terminology, create, read, update, delete, because sometimes it's, it, it encapsulate more than just like create, read, update and delete. If there happens, it's more usually in a create or update. In an update, for example, is it's usually more finer granular domain events hidden. So you try to have an explicit language that uh, describes what happens in your domain um, using domain events along a chronological order. You, then you try to, to sort them in chronological order. And then you try to apply some heuristics. So you add also over the course of the event storming um, sessions, you also complement it with other color-coded sticky notes. I don't go into detail um, of event storming right now, um, but it helps you to, to identify areas applying some heuristics. For example, there is also a great uh, resource like the GitHub report um, of DDD crew. It's also um, it's great to use for that um, perspective. To try to apply some heuristics, for example, is it a start or end of the process or start or end of the user journey? And do you have a handover from one actor to the other? Um, and this is something, um, or like later on, you also bring in then the aggregates that encapsulate, like when you come down to, to software design, it has different formats. It starts with a big picture of the event storming sessions, then process modeling, and later on software design. And uh, at the beginning, you collaborate with the domain experts together and you try to, like, uh, where you ad can identify some boundaries uh, where, for example, an actor, an actor could be an individual, a person, a department, a group, a team is involved in a sequence of domain event events and then another actor comes in. Maybe that is something from one actor to, not, to the other. It could be a boundary. Like an end over, right? Yeah, an end over, exactly. And, um, and also like, uh, so sometimes what I see is like, um, so God objects, like when we come later to do software design, that cause event storming can help you to create your initial software design as well. And a lot of like monolithic big ball of mud solutions that have evolved over the time. I see a lot of like God domain models, like huge domain models with, I don't know, 400 different fields. And every field has a different meaning in a different context. So all contexts in one God object or God domain model. And this is where then ubiquitous language comes in. For example, um, let's talk about a call for paper solution where a conference organizer is publishing a call for paper that um, set, um, a speaker can submit the session proposals. And then you evaluate this, the uh, submitted session proposals, create an agenda and something like that. If you create the agenda with the same object, there you have time slot and, and room, for example, as, as attributes, and you have to have apply business logic uh, that avoids to duplicate booking of the same session or duplicating the same room. But this attributes and this logic is not relevant when a speaker is submitting a session proposal, right? If you have the same object and then maybe their talk title, talk abstract, something like that, tags and something is relevant for submitting a session proposal, but not for... Uh, but they are not like, so they have different contexts if this is just one domain model. And um, so this is then, uh, it becomes like really big ball of mud over the time and uh, has this happens a lot. So you have different meanings, different contexts involved in one God object, object. And that's where the bounded context come in. You try to split it where, for example, session, like in the session proposal has a different meaning, a different context than the session that you create the agenda for later on when you publish the agenda for uh, the conference event, for example. And this is like, on the one side, you have a scheduled session or submit a, a session proposal, and then you add, you adjust your ubiquitous language to make it explicit. And this is an indication also uh, where we have two different contexts in, mm -hmm. in, in the game so that you, like a ubiquitous language is also very important, and that's you. That's the reason why you should be explicit in defining like your domain events and, and something like that. So when you do event storming sessions, uh, you, how I usually do it, and a lot of uh, like feedback that I get is from these sessions, um, like oh, we didn't know that this happens there as well. It's also not only for driving bounded context, but also for creating the shared understanding to have this uh, um, of the uh, they have this big picture of what happens in your domain. And um, mm -hmm. and it could go across bounded context. You can um, start broad and then dive into a specific area, and then go into details and that into that one. So um, that is something 
um, how I approach it and also um, to then have the two benefits of creating a shared understanding of our domain knowledge, what happens in your domain, like a shared domain knowledge, and then also to derive them bounded context later on. I feel like, of course, we can, we, we can focus on understanding the domains. Okay? We can focus on using te the techniques that you mentioned, like even storming. And by the way, Alberto Brandolini was on the podcast a few episodes uh, ago. So listeners, if you want to check it out, uh, maybe you can look into the uh, show notes where we will link the show. But my question for you is, when we do this kind of domain-driven design-based uh, definition of the bounded context inside the organization, we tend to have kind of subdomains which uh, resonate with certain capabilities that we have, certain processes that are fairly independent with each other, and that, of course, you know, that's why our aim, not, right, to, uh, to isolate pieces of the organization and its business process that are not very dependent on each other, right? That's essentially the, the idea. How do you balance this tendency of unbundling into process elements with, uh, let's say, some kind of constraint that uh, uses a, a product heuristic, right? So how do you uh, avoid unbundling in pieces that are too small and then people are not, not responsible of the business value or, or the customer value uh, or the profit and loss and so on. So I think uh, there is a, a, this kind of balance to, to seek, right? Into unbundling for the sake of unbundling and uh, unbundling, let's say, to a certain level where you can have a functional product, you can have a functional business process or a business model, right? Yeah, so definitely, uh, I guess you have to relate your bounded context also in the context of others. And as you said, like if you are too fine granular, I guess it, it, it's... It could happen. So it's, it's I guess, to, to avoid, sometimes it's like that you unbundle uh, tiny pieces and what is the side effect? Like, for example, um, in Neil Ford and Mark Richardson, they talked in uh, Software Architecture, the hard part about disintegrators, like how to decompose your system into modular. So there's service functionality that is, for example, or functionality in general, that could be a bounded context, but also like uh, volatility, uh, some other aspects as well that they put in for like disintegrator, like when to, to, to decompose your system to smaller parts. But they were also talking about integrators when it makes sense to bring them back together. Usually, um, bounded contracts are good candidates for microservices, but it does not necessarily mean that you have to unbundle your system into microservices. It could be also modular monoliths or domain services that are still accessing the same database, for example, so they don't have like end-to-end -end cut like the microservices have. So the bounded context that they, they do not dictate a specific architecture style, give you an indication where you have modular boundaries, but how you implement it, like what architecture style you will then apply that is then not related to domain-driven design. So they don't say, okay, use microservices for that one. That is something that you can later on I would suggest to make this decision very late. Um, first of all, is it's important to identify the boundaries, but how you then implement it later on and with all these trade-offs, like later on when you introduce microservices or if you even say, okay, let's introduce serverless technologies and go even more fine granular, uh, that is something not related to domain-driven to domain design. And I uh, would suggest like, okay, I always try to make trade-off analysis like together with the teams. Okay, what does it mean when we go this way or that way? And also um, then describe it, document it in our architecture decision records later on. What was the context we started with? What options do we have? What are the pros and cons? And if we decide for that one, what, be, what would be the consequence out of it? Because I, am, I have a very short lived memory. So uh, years later, I don't know why we decided that way. And the architecture decision records, for example, help you a lot with going back into your, like, what was the context back then? Maybe the context has changed. Um, and we can then uh, revise our previous decision and, and something like that. And maybe there is also, yeah, maybe that was too fine granular back then. Back then so, and maybe it's now where it's like, now we have to, we have to, experience some some struggles we we used microservices with its own data storage and decomposed everything from 
front end to business logic to to data storage and we uh, yeah identify some areas where they should go together again and uh, integrate them back again so that could happen i i would say that is something um to decide how you implement it also to do like a trade-off analysis later on to identify a modular a module or like um by bond context it could be like a package structure or something like that but how you implement it this this could be then was could be complemented with trade-off analysis. That's really interesting. And uh, forgive me if I ask you again, who, who was the one you were referring to with this concept of integrators and, and disintegrators? That was um, Neil Ford and Mark Richardson, uh, Software Architecture, The Hard Parts. So they have published two big books, uh, Software Architecture, The Hard Parts, and uh, okay. The Fundamentals of Software Architecture. I don't know exactly which one they were which had the integrators and disintegrators, but this was okay. more from a software architecture point of view. Let's try to recap. Now you use bounded context to understand uh, the, the boundaries of the pieces of the organization, let's say the modules of the organization. Then you understand their, uh, I mean, it's an iterative process, but then you understand their evolutionary stage. You start making considerations on what's a competitive advantage, what is something that uh, maybe is not a competitive advantage, but enables a lot of our capabilities, so we want to make it our own. Uh, and, and then also, what are the commodities that we shouldn't be building, but rather uh, buy from the market? So it's a very powerful uh, strategic awareness, a strategic understanding of your company. Then you have the team topologies part that is... Uh, one possible way to map this context, this bounded context into type of teams. So I would say when you say stream aligned teams for our listeners, it's just a clarification to say a team that can basically perform a certain long-term uh, development of a piece of a system. Essentially, it can have its own ownership. Then you can have platform teams and other type of teams that I don't want to dig in now. But you know, you have our listeners, if you didn't check team topologies yet, you should run and buy the book because it's one of the most significant uh, books on, on organizing companies and organizations that produce software. So it's, it's a way to map the bounded context with a certain type of teams. So, but if you add on top of this, and I think this is also a good hint for your part of development, if you add this idea of integrators, I think it's really powerful because integrators, so, so these kind of functions that uh, can tell you you know, you haven't bundled your organization into pieces, but now we, you know, try to bundle them in a way that makes sense for the market, for example. So when I think about the integrators, I was taking, I was taking notes. I can think of, for example, something that needs to have a business model. You know, that's a way to integrate into a product unit, for example, or, or maybe uh, something you can define the total cost of ownership of, and it's another integrator function, or maybe maybe even more soci socially uh, uh, wise, you can think of something for which you can have a leadership show up. Uh, so you can have someone, someone showing up and you know, taking ownership of a certain piece of, of this organization. So this is something you need if you want to, I don't know, build a business unit or, or a micro enterprise, for example, in our, in our uh, jargon, in our trio uh, random A jargon. So again, I think this idea of integrators that, that are kind of a heuristics and practices that can happen after you bundle the organization into the bound context and so on. Uh, it's a very powerful way to, and gives a lot of also pragmatism to the, to the process, right? It really helps you to rebundle the organization in a way that is very market oriented and leadership oriented and, and product oriented. Does it feel interesting or, or right uh, to some extent? Yeah, so definitely because you are, you are addressing the more from a product market business perspective. So uh, the integrators that uh, Neil Ford and Mark Richardson were talking about were more about like software architecture, but it can be complemented with those uh, elements that uh, um, aspect that you were mentioning. So they were talking about more from the technical or software architecture in terms of like uh, database transactions or data dependencies, but also mm -hmm. if they are part and that blends over to you or what you were saying, um, workflow, and in choreography. So do we have to, like, if it's too small and we have to implement a high level of choreography or high level of orchestration and, and maybe then put them together in one service, something like, um, for example. Or, so a, or it, a product area or something like that. Yeah, or product area. So, and I guess 
it's uh, something that you can reconsider um, and to, to see yeah, where it makes sense. And it could evolve over the time as well, right? What you have unbundled yesterday, maybe you have to integrate it together again uh, tomorrow. So um, mm -hmm. to see also like how your market will change or might change and to be adaptive to, to that change, I guess, that, that you can also mm -hmm. say, okay, let's, let's bring this together again. Where is your work going, Susan? So based on your intense consulting work, you speak at conferences all the time. So where is your work going even beyond the publication of the book? What are the signals you're getting for evolution of your work? From the evolution of my work, I guess it goes then like what you are building up on. Um, so for example, right now I have more smaller focus on maybe one product in an organization or multiple products in an organization. And I still talk about like teams. So for example, uh, what you're talking about, like having this the higher model concept uh, derived like this, having this uh, micro entrepreneurial team, I guess that is the next evolution, I would say, that is very important where you are then coming in with your services and, and your ideas. For example, one client, they would like to scenarios like the global IT in our organization, a large corporate. Um, that would like change mm -hmm. from control mechanism to be enabler, to have this uh, mindset, uh, culture and mindset uh, shift in an organization. I guess that is the most critical part, that the most hard, yeah, difficult part in an organization to have this cultural shift, to change the mindset from where you control a lot of things like, for example, infrastructure in your organization and how to enable then, for example, business units, like um, another one client is organized in business units and they are struggling a lot with, okay, how to, um, when we introduce a new change, like how can global IT help us with that one? Yeah, evolving from a, a bottleneck because right now it's a bottleneck because it's a lot of handovers involved, which requires a, lot, a high level of communication and coordination efforts between multiple teams to make a change effective and to change this and becoming an enabler so and also make like providing XSS services on the one side for services that are like for example hr uh, accounting something that every business unit needs and um how to provide XSS service on the one side um like for for example components that are more located on the right spectrum of a award map in the value chain if we derive value chain for the business units that every business units have but also like um, the role of global IT, like uh, on the one side, like becoming an enabler for um, the components where the business units are, um, yeah, dealing with their competitive advantage, where to help them to enable them for innovation, and have both enablers and excessive service coming from the team topology um, terminology combined, and to, for the future organization, the future that is then based on autonomy and trust and mm -hmm. uh, where we have not only different way of working established, but also a totally different culture mm -hmm. going from the restroom uh, cultural topologies invented by, uh, introduced by Ron Westrom from pathological bureaucratic to the generative culture where we have then, the teams are then uh, working in a safe trust trustful mm -hmm. environment and um, can then drive their own decisions, become totally uh, autonomous with micro-entrepreneurial mindset, I would say. That is mm -hmm. the next evolution, I would say. It's really interesting because um, I feel like uh, we are kind of uh, witnessing, you know, the, the transitions that are happening in the market, which have this powerful and disruptive nature towards organizations. And uh, these new techniques like yours or how I work with Brendan A and Trio and whatever are really emerging as, uh, as a way for us to figure out what's the meaning of organizations in a digitally transformed, uh, very easy to recombine, very low transaction cost market, right? right? So we were used to the bureaucracy as a way to maintain, let's say, the meaning of an organization. And now that things have changed, you know, it's much more easy to recombine, much more easy to interoperate, to communicate, and so on. What's the real functional meaning of the organization? And I think we are really grappling with these questions in novel ways. And, and uh, probably from your work, and maybe from our work as well, uh, we will have 
you know, a new kind of theory of organizing that uh, fits with uh, the dynamics and the landscape of the 21st uh, century. So really great work. Uh, Susan, can you just share with us maybe in the last uh, bit a couple of breadcrumbs that you want to leave to the audience uh, to dig more into into things that you believe are very fundamental for them to uh, to check and understand? Yeah, definitely. So it, it's um, I would love to share also the books that have impacted me. I mean, uh, a lot of books have impacted me, but I guess uh, we have only limited amount of time. Um, but of course, yeah. Um, Diving into, for example, um, domain-driven design, I can highly recommend, for example, Vlade Kononov has published his book, um, Learning Domain-Driven Design. Also, Vaughn Vernon with um, uh, Distilling Domain-Driven Design or Implementing Domain-Driven Design. And also Eric Evans' uh, Blue Bible of Domain-Driven Design. That is something I would recommend to read later because it's, it took me four times to, to go through it. So it's, it's mm-hmm. a good, that is the work to, you have to read. but. I would suggest to start with with the other books and then go into that book, for example. And then, of course, team topology, as you uh, as you also mentioned, uh, is very highly recommended, and also all the materials that they have on their um, website, including the academy, short video courses, online courses that you can uh, participate in. Then, of course, like a Wardley mapping. So Simon Wardley has also published his book under the Creative Commons license, so it's, it's for free. He uh, was so generous to publish it for free for every one of us. Um, but also, I highly recommend also going into the material that Ben Mosher, one of the water mapping advocates, has published on learnwaterlemapping.com. Uh, it's also great material that you can dive into. Um, currently, I'm uh, reading um, several books in parallel, to be honest. I uh, currently I read about corporate rebels, which I love a lot, uh, like a lot, um, about micro entrepreneurial teams. Also, a little bit going into the higher model. I, I really like that one, and um, so yeah. And then uh, the other one is uh, "Sooner, Safer, Happier" from John Smart. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so they are uh, trying now to go also more into the product development books as well. So that is something that I am explore next. Um, and happy to get some useful resources from you or others as well. So happy to share uh, also your recommendation. I'll go receiving recommendation from you as well. So these yes. are just like few few bits uh, I can highly recommend. Th- thank you so much. I mean, this is work that is foundational to our, to our work as well. So it's really good to remind uh, our listeners to check these uh, bodies of work uh, that, that you mentioned. It's really, really important. So I, uh, I think uh, we managed to have a very deep uh, conversation and uh, um, yeah, probably for the listeners, uh, uh, we will uh, kind of uh, have to have a disclaimer that they have to be familiar with some of the topics that we discussed. But uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we really kind of broke uh, some ground uh, here and uh, and introduce some new ideas. So I'm really really thankful for the conversation. I look forward to more uh, more more collaborations, more more, more sessions maybe. And uh, that is something also that we're working on uh, together with our friends Simon Wardley and, and Team Topologist Team. So probably coming up uh, later on for our listeners. So stay tuned. And uh, Suzanne, uh, thank you so much. I hope you also enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much. For our listeners, uh, as always, uh, uh, and uh, this time more than usual, because there's a lot of books and uh, references that Suzanne had uh, uh, mentioned during the conversation, don't forget to check the full uh, show notes on our blog. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, boundaryless.io slash resources slash podcast, you will find uh, the full transcript with the links, the notes and everything. So check it out. And until we speak again, uh, uh, don't forget to think boundaryless.